The Theosophical Society presents Jeffrey Hodson in a talk entitled Hidden Wisdom in the Christian Scriptures. Whilst I shall be suggesting that there may be under meanings, and as my title suggests, a hidden wisdom in certain of the books of our Bible, I wish to make it clear that I am not attacking or denying the historicity of our scriptures. I believe them to be founded on fact in very truth, but to be written by inspired men who knew the ageless wisdom and incorporated it in a kind of allegorical and symbolical way in the record of events in time. Today, whilst in some directions more and more people are responding to the call of religion and attending churches, there is also a growing resistance to orthodoxy and the demands of blind faith and belief in certain dogmas to which people thinking minds cannot assent. Interestingly enough, an approach to the scriptures as allegory and symbol, as well as history, strengthen one in one's ability to defend them and one's own faith. There is no doubt that, taken literally, our scriptures can be made strongly, if not devastatingly, subject to what is called analytical and higher criticism. What, what do the critics of our Bible say? What are their accusations? Very many, as they take the texts literally. They say that whilst miracles so-called may, may make the impossible happen or appear to happen for the onlookers, physical laws and astronomical facts cannot be changed. Some miracles are said to strain beyond reasonable limits one's power to believe. In the Bible, the waters of the Red Sea and the River Jordan were divided and held apart by thought power and divine power alone. Perhaps possible, granted, the intervention of the Supreme Deity or the highly trained will of man, but the heliocentric system, it is pointed out, cannot be altered. The sun is in the center of our universe and it is the giver of light. The rotation of the earth causes night and day and a movement of the sun round the earth does not do so and cannot be made to do so by anyone. Yet there were three days and three nights of creation before the sun and the moon were created. That's brought up against us, as it were, as we go to the defense of our scriptures and our religion. It's only in verse 16 of the first chapter of the book of Genesis, after three days and three nights of creation, that the sun and moon were created and the heavenly bodies, the luminaries, appeared. Difficult. Taken literally. Then Joshua, you remember, made the sun and the moon stand still to obtain a longer day. Well, if the sun did literally stand still upon Gibeon, meaning that if the earth stopped rotating on its axis, no human being would have lived to tell about it. Every loose object on earth, including Joshua, 
the oceans and the atmosphere would have continued the normal rotating movement and would have taken off towards the east faster than the speed of sound. Literally, scientifically true. The Lord God tells Moses to force the Pharaoh by plagues to free the Israelites. And yet after each plague, the Lord God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Samson was overcome not by strong ropes or willow branches by which he was firmly bound, but by having his hair cut off and binding him with that which conquered him. And the Lord God affirms that he commits the monstrous injustice of visiting the sins of the fathers upon the children even unto the third and fourth generation. Something that even a human father would never wish to do. And the walls of Jericho were brought down by shouting. A fig tree was cursed by our Lord, the Lord of love because it didn't produce any figs early in the spring when it could not have done so. Our Lord said, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, for my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. That's cannibalism. So the clever ones point out. And then the events of the night before the crucifixion are too numerous all to have occurred in one night. They were eleven in number at least. There was the Last Supper, which must have taken some time, for the Holy Eucharist was instituted then. Then came the agony in the garden. Then the betrayal in the darkness by Judas who kissed him the hailing before the Sanhedrin and all the questioning, the hailing before Pilate and the questioning in the Hall of Judgment late in the night, and courts to try malefactors do not sit in the middle of the night. Then there was a visit to Herod given by Luke, then the return to Pilate and his questioning and judgment, his speeches to the multitude and his washing of hands. Then came the handing over since Barabbas was refused and the scourging, the mocking, the arraying of Jesus in purple and putting on his brow the crown of thorns. Then came the long and painful journey carrying the heavy cross out from Jerusalem to Golgotha. And finally the crucifixion at sunrise. It is pointed out that those events could not have occurred in one night. What is the solution to these difficulties? One explanation comprised within the group of ideas known as theosophical is that the Bible, like other scriptures, is written in a particular metaphorical language full of imagery and symbolism. And that this very ancient language was designed, invented, to convey metaphysical ideas and to describe supersensory states of consciousness rather than historical events alone. And the authors who write in this allegorical manner wish to reveal mystical truths and they use history only as the weft and the warp upon which to weave a representation of everlasting truths and deeply occult wisdom. Time and the world of time with its physical and astronomical laws, these were of far less importance to them than eternity and the eternal verities of which they wrote. 
so that when we read the world's scriptures and myths, we need to remember that we are reading a special category of literature. Strange, foreign, yes, foreign to us at first. We need a dictionary. We must learn the meaning of the words, the intent of the authors, and how to interpret the allegories and the symbols. Then, then as we learn to lift the veil of allegory and symbol and imagery and incredibility and impossibility, then many wonderful truths will shine forth. Hidden for safety. Just as physically discovered energy can be and generally is at first used for destructive purposes, so psychological and spiritual knowledge gives power far more destructive, not so much of bodies, but of the very psyche and the evolution of the soul itself. And therefore, the the inspired authors, having discovered profound wisdom, veiled it in a special language of symbol. They thus affirmed, preserved or filed it forever. They concealed it from the profane and made it available to those who were able to penetrate the veil and discover the shining truth and the vaster consciousness underneath. Now this approach to the scriptures makes nothing of the clever criticism and leads one to those deeper spiritual ideas below and behind that mysterious veil. How are we going to discover them? How can you and I take our Bible and thus read it? Well, theosophy offers methods of interpretation which we can try, use for experimentation. Let me put three or four of them before you. Concentrating on them rather longer than I normally would for the sake of students of the ancient wisdom present. But if then there is time, taking one or two stories, seeing the symbols in their places, and trying to discern a deeply significant, timeless truth. What then are the keys which will unlock this treasure house of truth? concealed layer upon layer within it, which is our Bible. Well, the first one is that everything which is recorded as history is really a description of an interior experience. Each recorded event describes a subjective and spiritual experience of man. An account of a single external event is also descriptive of a universal human experience. It may sound strange, but you will remember that St. Paul used this very means of conveying such mystical ideas. For him, the nativity was not an event which happened in Bethlehem alone. It was an interior experience. And he wrote that he yearned over his converts that the Christ might be formed within them. He also said, Christ in you, your hope of glory. Obviously he's not referring to the historical saviour at all, but to an interior power, the Christ nature in man. And so that's the first key sometimes called the master key. All stories describe interior experiences of everyone, particularly, I suppose, of the reader. The second key, what could that be? 
Each of the people in the Bible represents a state or condition or power or weakness of human nature and consciousness. All the actors are personifications of aspects of human nature. Attributes, principles, faculties of man. For instance, we theosophists are taught and we teach that man is a sevenfold being. The innermost self being the highest spirit in him. The dweller in the innermost. The spiritual source of inspiration and fructifying spiritual power. Next, the Christ nature in man. Asleep, unborn, unawakened, in the majority as yet, it is said. Next, the abstract intelligence, out of which the Christ nature appears and through which it is expressed, the higher mind. That's the threefold spiritual self of man. It is operating during physical life through his analytical mind, his emotions, his vital energy and its container, the etheric double and this physical body. Sevenfold in all. And the people in the Bible personify one or more of these parts of the makeup of man, it is said. Let's test that. Look back at the Annunciation and the Nativity for a moment. What was the situation? The Archangel Gabriel is the Annunciator, the bringer of the fructifying, spiritually awakening power, the spirit self in man. Mary who heard the voice of the God within herself, is the higher mind of man. The Christ was born after the Annunciation, the union of spirit self and abstract spiritual intelligence leads to the birth of intuition, realization of the oneness of all life, the awakening or birth of the Christ nature of divine love, compassion and power in man. An immaculate conception in very truth. But also, Joseph was there. But he represents the analytical, mature, wise, formal mind. Out of which intuition cannot be born. Only out of the prophetic, synthesizing mind do the flashing revelations of the intuition appear, not from the argumentative, analytical, critical mind. And so Joseph is there, but he's not the father. He's rightly and wisely and wonderfully made the putative father, foster father only, to guide the intuition through the active mind when it is born. The animals, it was in a stable of an inn. The tamed, spiritualized emotions of man. The manger in which the child was laid. That which contains nutriment, food, vitalizing energy. The manger, the etheric double. Stable itself, the physical body. So you see this wondrous event with its mysterious Inner significances, said to be describing one of the great expansions of consciousness called initiation, which in truth involves the whole man from highest to lowest. So in the story of the nativity, all the principles and parts of man are there. And the star of the one great initiator on our earth, shines over as the star of Bethlehem. And certain high officials in the adept guidance of the world. Three great lords appear to bestow their gift upon the newly born. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. And all the while the great angels chant 
the glories of the triumph of the initiate, newborn. A continuously recurring experience amongst men. It's here and there, century by century, one or another passes through the gateway, finds the hall of initiation, the stable of an inn, the despised place. And there receive the spiritual accolade. The whole seven principles of man are brought into that inspired story, an example of personification. Then the humility, the devotion and the love of Mary, the mother of Jesus, of whom the Christ was born, that is in us, part of our nature. The human frailty, the inherent sainthood of a Mary Magdalene, a Peter, and even a Judas in us all. As also the Christ principle, even if asleep at first, as in the story of the stilling of the tempest. Eventually to awake, assume command, particularly over the storm of the emotional nature of man, for the whole scene took place on water. And so the zodiacal signs and all the twelve disciples, they represent characteristics of man. The impulsiveness of Peter, the simplicity of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the businessman Matthew at the receipt of custom, the power of devoted and faithful love, personified by John, the only disciple who was present both in the courtroom and at the foot of the cross. Present in us also, as I've just said, the Judas danger, weakness, cupidity, disloyalty. The Judas by whom the Lord, the divine within us, can be betrayed. But fortunately also in each and every one of us. Again, I point out, the Christ nature, the God self, is within each one of us. So the second key is that people in the great stories personify aspects of nature and of man. Now third key. Each story is a graphic description of phases of the evolutionary journey of the soul of man on its way to perfection. Whether the soul is treading the normal evolutionary pathway or has responded to our Lord's call to pass the straight gate and enter upon the narrow way that leads swiftly to life eternal experiences on both ways are vividly described but in allegory and in symbol I've just attempted an example the nativity an interior expansion of consciousness the awakening of divine love power and compassion for all that live as the Christ self within arises and comes to power over the very human man below, without. A great initiation it is called. The baptism, a further stage in which the soul becomes engulfed temporarily in the waters of this world sorrow, that later he may save the world from sorrow. He emerges therefrom stronger, wiser, and with a new authority, a new level of consciousness, or as it says, a new heaven open. And the Spirit of God descends upon him in the symbol, the bird symbol, of divinity in the form of a dove. Follow the, follow the temptations in the wilderness. I'll touch on that in a moment. And then the victory and the third great expansion of consciousness. Transfiguration of the whole being on the Mount of Transfiguration. The 
third great initiation, followed by the darkness of Gethsemane when he must learn to stand alone and all outside aid is withdrawn and thus alone he goes on through the trial and the agony and death on Golgotha symbolically so that the very heart cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? the bitterest of all ordeals. The hour of hoped-for triumph becomes one of deepest ignominy. He sees his enemies around him. He's deserted by his friends. He drinks the bitter draught of solitude, isolation and betrayal. He cries out, yes, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The ordeal is said to be necessary. For only when every external, even divine aid, is lost, apparently withdrawn, only then can he discover fully the divinity within himself and know that he is the eternal and the eternal is himself. And he's beyond the possibility of separation and the delusion of separateness ever anymore. It's the really the great coronation of the spirit. The last great triumph, followed by resurrection and ascension into heaven. Interior experiences of the most glorious kind through which men and women are passing secretly but sublimely, age by age, as man passes to superman. And this secret, occult, wisdom and life of our planet is here marvelously portrayed in the manner of the telling of the life of our Lord. And so the third key is that each story describes phases of evolution and experiences passing through those phases. And the fourth key, a fourth key, is that in the sacred language all objects have their own special meaning. And you have to learn to interpret them as symbols, finding that their meaning is constant, east and west, in all the old great religions of the world, as constant also is the doctrine everywhere revealed. The underlying ageless spiritual wisdom, the, the riches of man upon this globe, it's all there. But because it bestows power, magical power, hypnotic power, it has its dangers as well. And so it's carefully, compassionately veiled. But it's there for he, for him or her who can discern and rightly use it. Well, what do the objects mean then in the Bible? What is a mountain, a plain, a valley, a wilderness and a tree, a fish and a hill? States of consciousness, of course. And the elements of earth, water, air and fire indicate those states. If they're earthly objects, then it's waking consciousness, such as we are employing at this moment in our physical bodies on this physical plane here on earth. We are aware physically. And to describe our experiences, physical objects would be used. If we're exalted, as we'll see directly, we'd be on a mountaintop. If we're deeply depressed, we'd be in a plain, in a valley. If we are passing through spiritual aridity, feel lost and uninspired for a time, we're in the wilderness. Physical places, physical objects are skillfully used to point to physical states of waking consciousness. If it's on water and involves water in the purely human interpretation, then the emotional life of man. In the cosmic interpretation, which every story also bears, then the waters of space, the vast sea of cosmic space, pre-cosmic space, the great abyss, 
the great deep upon which the great breath symbolically was breathed to bring about the emanation of a universe. All sublime verities told in symbolical language. Airy beings, powers and experiences, the intuition on the whole. Fire, both the destructive aspect of the analytical mind and the fiery creative energy in nature and in man. Gardens, vineyards, fields, a fruitful state of consciousness. Our Lord used that in the parable of the sower, in which some seed fell on rocky ground, couldn't germinate, some on thorny ground, and the thorns sprang up and choked the crop as it arose. But some on fertile ground brought forth fruit a hundredfold. Then he himself used these very keys, saying there was no seed, no rocks or thorns or fertile ground. It's a condition of the mind that's being described. Some there be whose minds are rocky to truth. You can't plant seed ideas of divinity in them. Some beginning, but there are thorns. Personal limitations. Desires which kill the intuition. But there are some and a growing number in the world today. Fertile ground, the mind and the consciousness of man, ancient and modern when a seed of truth or wisdom falls there we happen to be fertile ah then the seed ideas grow slowly within our consciousness gradually to become powers in our lives guided thereafter by deep understanding which we can share with others now that's all too abstract for the multitude so it's told in the guise of parable. Gardens also symbolize the opening of new cycles. The very story itself, you'll remember, begins in a garden. As far as our earth is concerned, and the new dispensation after the death of our Lord. There also, because there, Mary, whose soul was open, saw her master in a garden. Deserts, wildernesses, spiritual aridity, utter dryness. Sun, the highest spiritual nature of man. The monad, the invincible, inconquerable spirit will. The moon, the mortal man, illumined only by the light of its own inner self. And he who, like Joshua, can bring the monad to the midst of the heavens, the position of maximum power, will never more know night. As Isaiah also said, and the days of his mourning shall be ended, for he's discovered his own eternal spiritual light. He conquers his enemies, the lower nature, and abides forever in the light of day. Animals, the predatory desires of man. Ships, arcs and cradles, the containing and conveying body, whether physical or spiritual, whether human or divine, as of a universe. Water, the emotion. Sea monsters, passion. But the fish, the Christ consciousness, the Christ-like wisdom, born of the union of will, universal love, and the synthesizing mind. Personal love, sublimated to become all-inclusive compassion, which leads to healing, helping, teaching, sharing, the saving of men. All this is symbolized by the fish. The real symbol, some say, of our Christian faith. And it's strange that in the catechisms of catacomb, catacombs of Rome, where the early Christians worshipped in secret, the chief symbol there is the fish. It symbolizes the, the condition of consciousness of Christhood. And it's interesting also that the mitre of the bishop 
is shaped like a fish's head with open mouth, possibly as a symbol that such a high dignitary has attained to the state of consciousness and life indicated by the fish, symbol of the Christ. Birds, or air, I should say, the intuition. Unless it's rushing, then the disturbed emotion. Birds, the divinity. They are threefold, body and two wings, the trinity. Fire, the restless, destructive aspects of the formal mind and the creative fire in man. Trees, tree trunks, staffs, wands, rods and pillars, the spinal cord of man wherein that fire is in sheep. Tree of life, the all-pervading, all-sheltering, all-producing, ever-active, creative divine life, the tree of life. Marriage in the stories very often refers to the union of the lower and the higher consciousness of man, self-spiritualization, night, blindness, sleep and death, states of spiritual unawareness, spirituality temporally lost, mentally blind. Their healing and recovery by, say, the Christ, the awakening of the Christ nature, which restores vision of eternal spiritual truth. The blind receive their sight. Day comes and a Peter recovers and repents. Such, then, are some, only a few, of the meanings possibly to be attributed to certain objects as indicated by a fourth key. But still I haven't touched upon the incongruities and the impossibilities. Ah, yes. But they too represent indication. Blinds, as they are called. And a famous rabbi of the 14th century, Moses Maimonides, the Jewish theologian and historian of the 13th century wrote, every time that you find in our book a tale the reality of which seems impossible, a story which is repugnant to both reason and common sense, then be sure that the tale contains a profound allegory veiling a deeply mysterious truth. And he concludes with these words, and the greater the absurdity of the letter, the deeper the wisdom of the spirit. There's the answer to the critics. They're intended to be deceived less prematurely. They or any of us, any of us should discover a knowledge and a power beyond our capacity to control or wisely to you. But we may be very sure when the moment the time comes when added light, added knowledge and a true teacher is needed and would help us, that wisdom, that knowledge will be given to us and that teacher will appear. And in a way I personally, after 45 years of study of it, regard theosophy as that wisdom that knowledge, yes, and that teacher. Now, Mac, have I time to apply some of these keys? A little, I see. Shall we take the story of the woman healed? You remember she'd been sick for 12 years, sought out many physicians, and as the text says, neither had she, be he had she been healed healed of any. And then she heard that a great healer was in the land. Despite her weakness, strengthened by an inner intuitive faith, she set out to find him. Eventually did so, but there was a press of people, a throng in the way. She knew that if she could but touch him, she'd be whole. So she, she stretched forth her hand through the throng and touched, not him, 
the hem of his garment. It was enough. Straightway she was healed. She was whole. Cameo. A beautiful miniature mystery drama of the illumination of the soul of evolving and evolved man. It is our self, that woman. You and me and all of us. Sick from one point of view in that we are imperfect men and women as yet. On the way, but not arrived. How to hurry up, as she did. Seek the wisdom, seek the truth, seek the God self, the Christ nature within. Yes, but as soon as we do so, we're, we meet difficulties, do we not? All kind of obstacles are between us and the divine, which is our real self. Selfishness, cruelty, sensuality, self-indulgence, interest in things material and in possessing them. They blind us, shut us out. What to do, as she did? Stretch out her hand. Reach up with aspiring for through the throng. Touch the hem of his garment. Beautiful symbol for the fringe of the divine consciousness within us. It will be enough. Tap only at the fringe this divine nature within each and every man. And down there will come pouring an integrating, illuminating power and light straightway we will be whole so a highly abstract and mystical truth is told in a beautiful little story every unchrist like attribute and action and thought and motive of ours this is the throne we must first press through it like that eventually they must go of course but when once we've touched the hem of his garment, whether of the Christ within us or the Holy Lord Christ himself, it will be enough. We shall enter that world of light and life and glory and beauty. Illumination will be ours and then, thus exalted and empowered, we can say to thee, evil within us, be gone. We shall be whole. Now the mount symbol. The higher consciousness whilst wide awake, as I said. The plain by contrast, purely material, physical consciousness. The valley, wanton materialism. Elijah on Mount Horeb desired to communicate with the Lord. And a voice said, go out and stand upon the mountain before the Lord, Elijah. And then there came an earthquake. And the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then a, then a strong wind and then a fire. And the Lord was not in the wind and not in the fire. But after the rumble of the earthquake and the rush of the wind and the crackle of the fire, there was silence. And in that utter inner stillness above body and mind, the still, small voice of the Lord. A manual of meditation, I suggest. Not whilst fully awake physically, wholly absorbed here in this restless, unreliable, transitive physical world. Not under the impulse of the rushing emotion. Not when the mind is analyzing and destroying all the time. But after consciousness has been elevated, through, above and beyond them and enters that region of stillness which is there within each one of us then in the utter inner silence of the sanctuary of the soul in truth the voice of the silence may be heard Human enlightenment is portrayed. Moses on Mount Sinai, 
hears the voice of the Lord, receives the Ten Commandments. The Israelites in the valley, worshipping the golden calf symbol of mammon, could never do so. Symbolically, the tablets of the law were broken on the way down. It's not an act, it's a law. You cannot listen in to long wave and short wave radio at the same time. You can't be absorbed in materialism and wantonness and hear the still small voice. Whether on Mount Horeb, Sinai, or the Mount of Transfiguration, they all mean the same. For there also our Lord was transfigured. Exalted states of consciousness. And finally for the time really has gone now. That symbol of the fish. As I said the Christ consciousness. The Christ power and life and ever upwelling spiritual vitality and life and grace. The fish. As indicated by the astrological meaning attributed to the sign Pisces. The Christ conscious. And so our Lord goes on a hill followed by 5,000 and there's no food. Only five loaves and a few fish. He feeds them all. And the miracle is also that there's more afterwards than before. Even unto twelve baskets full. So it is that when that inner Christ love, compassion, healing ministration is poured out upon the world, there is not loss but gain. More wisdom, intuitive perception and healing life well up from within and the wider the channels for its flow even unto twelve baskets for the totality of wisdom. Part of the great message of Christianity to man, I believe, that all we need is within us. We must learn to seek also there. And that's portrayed in the tribute money incident, when a denarius was required to pay the tribute. And our Lord said, catch a fish. And they did, opened it, and there within was the exact sum. So within the fish or Christ self within us is the all-sufficing life, wisdom, understanding and love to fulfill every human need. But try to hold it for yourself and what happens. The symbol of the net comes in there, the possessive mind. And so after the miraculous draft, if there had been a possessiveness, then the nets break and all was lost. You cannot bind divine wisdom, divine love, divine truth. And so, and with his words I will close, our Lord himself, when calling to his disciples and calling them to him, said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. My first question is, the myths of Hercules, Dionysius, etc., are identical in meaning, apparently, to that of the Lord Christ in the New Testament. Oh yes, every saviour. And the stories are almost identical. Generally, the child is immaculately or mysteriously born, threatened by powers, either human or natural, saved miraculously, grow up and go, come to be saviors of the world. Hercules, for example, was attacked in his cradle by two serpents, representing that serpentine creative fire in man, which can either create, illumine and perfect or destroy. Hercules, though an infant, strangled them one in either hand. The Lord Sri Krishna, whose life so closely resembles that of our Lord, that he's called the Indian Christ, 
although he lived at least 1300 years, some scholars say, before the coming of our Lord. He was born in prison. The wicked uncle, King Kansa, the Herod of the time, had had a prophecy, just as Herod had received one, that a child would be born from these two parents and would come to power and dethrone him. So he put the parents in prison and as each child was born to them he cut its head off until a seventh child was born. And then the angels came and put the guards to sleep, struck the fetters off the father's limbs, opened the locked doors and he crept out and took the child over and handed it over to some shepherdesses, the gopis, who brought him up in the forest of Vrindavna with the foster mother Yasoda. And one of her children was brought back into prison. Many attacks were made, including that by a serpent, which poisoned a stream in which he and others were bathing as a young man so that all the water became black and death-like. And Sri Krishna went in and he leapt up onto the head of the seven-headed serpent, Kaliya, and danced upon it, turning all the poison into love. And so he went on with wondrous similar stories. Victory over the serpent, you see, and other evil, teaching the wisdom just the same. Yes, these are universal ideas, as you say, and a universal language is used both to conceal and to convey them. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we are still rather early in the history of them. The translations are by no means complete, even all the fragments are not complete. But, as far as has, has gone, some of the translations might seem to indicate that there did appear in Palestine 100 years before the birth of our Lord, according to our Christian computation, a one called a teacher of righteousness. And the strange thing is that some of the phrases and ideas were exactly those used by Jesus. But we can't come to a conclusion yet until more information is in our hands and translations become available which are not made by theologians but by scholars who will give us the exact truth, unmodified. What is the meaning of the old dispensation and the new dispensation? Well, I only meant the time when our Lord was living on earth the first 30 or 31 years when he was present at and in three and a half of them actively teaching amongst his disciples and the people of Judea one dispensation and then the death after which a new dispensation began that's all I meant